Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, dear Mark, it's a pleasure for me to come back here to this Institute of Cultural Diplomacy. Since I remember, I was here for the first time uh, about four years ago as one of my uh, first uh, events in my new position then as a Parliamentary State Secretary in our Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. Now, I I'm Parliamentary State Secretary in our Ministry of Defense, and I decided to say that I do the same things than before, and that is working for peace and uh, security. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about 30 years of uh, the fall of Berlin Wall, 30 years of unity in Germany, in Europe, and of course, at first, it was a question of sovereignty for Germany. Germany regained its sovereignty by this unification. In those times, we had in West Germany a ministry of inner German affairs. And we used the term of Germany policy for addressing this German question to be resolved, and that is how to overcome this iron curtain and this wall in Berlin and uh, through Germany. It was a major turning point not only for Germany that uh, the wall has fallen, it was also a major turning point in global politics. The East-West conflict had been characterized by a balance of terror between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. The bloc confrontation ended because uh, the Soviet Union basically ran out of breath in its arms race with NATO and in its economy collapsed, with its economy collapsed. So the question is, what has remained of this miracle? It was described by the German expert and British historian Timothy Garten Ash as an annus mirabilis, a year of miracles. What has remained of this miracle 30 years after the wall, the fall of the wall? What are the lessons learned and what are the lessons maybe not learned? So I want to elaborate a bit on the general aspects of this political and social history in Germany. Then I want to elaborate some ideas, some aspects on security policy, and in a third step, I want to give you some insight in the development of the Bundeswehr and the current situation. As has already been mentioned by Mark Dunfried, uh, 1990 was the year in which uh, the people took the power, and this uh, exemplifies the strength of democratic forces. Before, in 1975 already, the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe paved the way for the Democrats' victory. In the context of softening of the Iron Curtain, the Kremlin leadership was unable to satisfy increasing demands of both consumer goods and armament production. Glasnost and Perestroika, as well as the INF Treaty, became necessary under Mikhail Gorbachev in order to save the Soviet economy from misery. This, in turn, created an excellent anchor point for the German Chancellor's Helmut Kohl's wise and trust-building government policy. In the end, maybe you remember the pictures from those times, it was indeed the personal contact, the network between George Bush, Helmut Kohl, Mikhail Gorbachev, and the European leaders who made this way possible. The German Democratic Republic of uh, Germany was unified in a way that was foreseen in our basic law. It was an accession to the purview of the basic law in Western Germany. So the advantages of this basic law applied to all citizens of reunified Germany. The inner German border which had cost so many lives, was quietly and thoroughly dismantled. East and West Germany were finally able to come closer together again. And of course, there have been many individual sacrifices from uh, the citizens of former Eastern Germany. 
we had uh, to overcome 40 years of separation and socialist dictatorship and for the East German population further 13 years of Nazi dictatorship so it was a longer period of continuous <laughs> dictatorship and many of the citizens of Eastern Germany had quite good insights in Western Germany because they could watch TV from of West Germany. This was not used for uh, citizens of West Germany. It, there were some TV broadcasts and I indeed remember that sometimes at home we watched uh, East German TV as well. But uh, there was a huge loss of knowledge, even geographic knowledge of uh, Eastern Germany. So we had to explore our unified country after 1990 and I really remember how often we traveled eastwards and the Eastern citizens traveled westwards of course but we didn't know even the, the names of, of the main cities in East, uh, Eastern Germany. We really had to explore our country again after 40 years of separation and of course uh, there were great success, economic success, in recovery, a reconstruction of the entire country. We have flourishing landscapes. This is a quote by Helmut Kohl. He was very much criticized by this vision of creating flourishing landscapes. But in the end, we have flourishing landscapes in many areas of Eastern Germany. But of course, things are diverse, not in all regions. Things are running well. And we see, for example, that even after 30 years, the levels of wages and pensions are lower in the new lender. The unemployment rates are higher in the new lender. So there are indeed challenges ahead of us. And this shows unifying a country is a task for more than one generation. And indeed, we have some very substantial aspects in this unification process because we see that for example the way to live in in villages in remote areas is potentially different between east and west germany until today so there is a widespread uh, civilization across many remote areas in uh, the new lander or to turn it in a positive way. Um, the remote areas, um, the rural areas are stronger in Eastern uh, Germany than in Western Germany. Or if you uh, take uh, the economy, um, of course there is a um, higher density of investments of uh, companies seated in Western Germany than in Eastern Germany and you can still see it here in Berlin. Berlin suffered <coughs> particularly from 40 years of the division of our entire country and this specific city, this wall in Berlin. So there were lower investments in Berlin for 40 years and you, you can see it until today. Uh, Berlin is a capital city with a comparatively low uh, rate of investments, lower rate of working places than many capital cities in the world. After German unification in 1990, we had the 2 plus 4 treaty that entered into force in 1991. 2 plus 4 treaty concluded between Federal Republic of Germany and German Democratic Republic as two partners, and the four were the four ally, allies of uh, the Second World War, United States, Soviet Union, United Kingdom, and France. And this two plus four treaty formally brought us our full sovereignty on the basis of international law. This is um, absolutely key for our understanding because uh, indeed before this 2 plus 4 treaty, the former allies of the Second World War had uh, uh, rights uh, over Germany as a whole and the city of Berlin. 
and these uh, positions have been withdrawn and Germany regained full sovereignty by uh, depositing the ratification documents of this 2 plus 4 treaty. Now let me give you some uh, aspects of security and uh, defense policy. During uh, the Cold War era, we had this balance of terror. We counted our weapon systems, aircrafts, tanks. For example, the USSR had more than 35,000 nuclear warheads, 53,000 tanks, 4 million military personnel. Germany in those times had about 4,500 tanks. And um, the idea was to secure our NATO alliance, and the same applied to the Warsaw Pact, by mutual deterrence. And uh, the decline of the Soviet Union was followed by the dissolution of the Warsaw Treaty Organization in 1991, which uh, formally ended the East-West conflict. In consequence, uh, the Soviet troops were withdrawn in 1994 from Germany. And the new situation for Germany was that we are surrounded since then by France only. This was a new situation. So we were no longer a frontline state. We were in the midst of Europe. We are in the midst of Europe. At first, however, the Eastern German National People's Army needed to be dissolved at the national level and part of the personnel body had to be integrated into the Bundeswehr. The United Armed Forces in Germany, both from Western and Eastern Germany, had about 540,000 people. And in this 2 plus 4 treaty, it was uh, concluded that the German Unified Army had to be reduced from about 540,000 to 370,000 military personnel. The reality is that we reduced uh, our army even uh, far up to today 183,000. The lowest level a few years ago was uh, 176,000. Now we are increasing and growing again. So we have uh, 183,000 soldiers today, and uh, the intention is to grow up to 203,000 until 2024. But this is still much less than concluded in the 2 plus 4 treaty in 1991. Of course, the situation the security situation significantly changed after German unification. Some historics argued that they would now start an era of peace, uh, but uh, already in 1990, in the, in the following years after 1990, the war in former Yugoslavia showed us that um, things changed. We had a lasting period of peace but um, there was a new call for international commitment, for out-of-area operations, blue helmet missions, and operations abroad. This was totally new for the German armed forces. Before German unity, we were part of NATO. We were educated to deter our adversaries beyond the Iron Curtain, but there was no international engagement of German soldiers at all. And this changed in, uh, with, with this um, war in former Yugoslavia. The Bundeswehr became an army on operations, and this was uh, very sensitive and uh, hard uh, debate in Germany. We had a constitutional court's uh, decision in 1994 stating that the deploying of troops abroad uh, would need, uh, would require the approval of the German Bundestag. In their explanatory statement, the judges emphasized 
that the provisions of the basic law with respect to the armed forces stipulate, I quote, not to leave the Bundeswehr to the executive alone for use as an instrument of power, but to integrate it into the democratic constitutional order as an army of parliament. Quote end. This is the position since then, and that's why Germany has a different approach to the deployment of troops in, in comparison to many of our NATO partners. In reality, our armed forces gained entirely new experience with respect to fallen soldiers, for example, during the mission in Afghanistan. And the stabilization mission made it clear that comprehensive approaches were necessary for one, but that German military personnel had to stand the test in combat and warlike situations as well. Not too much later, in the Ukraine in 2014, developments have been another major turning point in the security situation. Crimea was annexed. The Bundeswehr had been adjusted for stabilization missions across the entire spectrum between high and low intensity rather than for national and alliance defense. So before the Ukraine, there was a focal area of deploying our troops abroad, which was not used in the German army. We made our first experience in this. At the same time, we had to concentrate our uh, financial and uh, military equipment, um, financial resources and military equipment to the soldiers in mission, in operations. The effect was that uh, there were capability gaps in national and collective defense. So the peace dividend from the end of the Cold War lead, led also to eroded structures in our army. And we're still engaged in filling these capability gaps. We are growing again since uh, 2014 in our budget. We significantly increased our defense budget by 40% since 2014, we increased our troops, as I told you, from 176 to now 183, and further up, further on, to 203,000 soldiers. And also, in terms of equipment, uh, we have huge capability gaps to be filled. We make some progress, but uh, there are some still some years needed to achieve uh, the, the level of ambition we concluded not only in German in our conceptual documents like a white paper from 2016 on our security policy, but also in, uh, in coordination with our EU and NATO partners. Of course, we are challenged by new security threats, hybrid wars, cyber warfare, to name a few. For example, we have uh, we count about 4,500 cyber attacks per day only uh, against uh, the networks of the Bundeswehr. So not the entire government, only Bundeswehr networks are attacked more than 4,000, 4,500 times each day. And this uh, shows that uh, we are f confronted with uh, really challenging new security threats below the level of military intervention or operation. This is what uh, uh, we describe as hybrid uh, warfare. The confrontation with Russia seems also to be or is described by some people as new Cold War and the Baltic region, its arena we have to realize that nuclear power potentials remain, nuclear potentials remain unchanged or have been developed further and still lend this conflict a particular explosiveness. However, Germany is no longer a frontline country, but a strategic transit country and logistic hub within the scope of eastward shifting alliance defense. And indeed, there again is a new aspect of our security policy and of uh, NATO solidarity. If you look in the Baltics, 
um, we deploy for year for months already and for years German troops to Lithuania in this operation enhanced forward presence and we contribute to the air policing in Estonia together with uh, Netherlands and UK and other NATO partners so this again is a new experience for Germany that solidarity within NATO is not exclusively for emergency situations it's an everyday business and this has to be exercised and exemplified by such operations as enhanced forward presence in Lithuania and uh, air policing in Estonia. Finally, let me outline some aspects on the role of uh, the Bundeswehr and our experience. During the East-West conflict, the Bundeswehr has proved to be an outstanding instrument of the German policy of sovereignty. First, the West German defense contribution to NATO was instrumental in achieving partial sovereignty by 1990. At the same time, the Bundeswehr integrated into NATO structures and going without a national high command of its own contributed effectively together with its transatlantic allies to deterrence against the Warsaw Pact. It was this military might that secured peace in Europe until the German unification and contributed to the collapse of the Soviet Union. After all, the Soviet Union had been armed to death, as our former federal president Richard von Weizsäcker said. And the Bundeswehr is the army of unity, contributed as army of unity, it contributed significantly to completing the German reunification. The often cited concept army of unity, however, does not mean that the merger between the old West German Bundeswehr and the East German National People's Army took place on an equal footing. Rather, the National People's Army was disbanded on 2nd October 1990 and suitable applicants were accepted into the Bundeswehr from 3rd October 1990. Comradeship helped to convey the principles of a free democracy, such as leadership development and civic education to the new Eastern citizens in uniform. And indeed, if you look at armed forces in each country, they are a factor of unity, of unifying the society. And of course, this was the case in Germany too after unification. And the words army of unity mean to say that the military's common tasks and efforts made the walls in the heads of service members from Western East Germany disappear much faster than in many parts of civil society. So the army was the place where young people from East and West met each other and learned from each other. And there are many operations inside our country. The Oda Flood 1997, the flood in Dresden 2002, who were most practical and pragmatic operations um, showing this uh, unification of our citizens from East and West. So this makes the Bundeswehr a case in point for successful transformation during a time of radical changes that was difficult for all, so for all of society and a role model in the integration process of the reunited Germany. And today the National People's Army, on the other hand, is barely relevant anymore for many people, especially young people. In its place, the Bundeswehr has become an appealing and important employer, particularly for those who live in regions of East Germany that are still economically weak. And indeed, as uh, if you remember, I told you that there are many remote areas in the new lander, uh, less uh, seats of uh, companies, um, less uh, economic investment, higher unemployment rates, and this of course leads also to a higher attractiveness, I would say, of the Bundeswehr in East Germany uh, with most relevant, um, uh, most relevant institutions of our army in East Germany. Um, as to its expanded task spectrum, the Bundeswehr has conducted more than 50 operations abroad until today 
and made numerous contributions to ensure that Germany increasingly lives up to its greater international responsibility, so the Bundeswehr became a force on operations. The spectrum ranged from observer missions to humanitarian aid, stabilization operations, and evacuation operations. The Bundeswehr has received much international recognition in its operations and thus contributed to Germany's image as a reliable ally. And if you look at our deployments, maybe Afghanistan is a specific case as an Article 5 operation of NATO, um, but uh, the majority of our deployments is around Europe. In Kosovo, the Balkans, I mentioned uh, the the exercises in the Baltics. We are contributing to the UNIFIL mandate in Lebanon. We deployed uh, surveillance aircrafts in Jordan. We contribute to um, a training in Iraq, and we deployed with major deployments in Mali, and uh, a few personal staff, office, uh, staff officers in South Sudan, in Djibouti, and in uh, uh, Sudan. So if you combine all these locations where Germany deployed troops, you can easily see that there is a belt around the European Union. And I think this is an important narrative for our security policy. We live in peace for 70 years now in Germany. And it's in our own interest as Germans, as Europeans, not only to secure our continent, but also to contribute to stabilizing our neighboring regions, whether it's uh, the Balkans or the Middle East or Northern Africa. And to go even further, I would say we are right now in learning a new lesson that uh, we should also look <coughs> at the global challenges we are confronted with. So far, our concept of uh, German security policy is based on two pillars. The one is national and collective defense. The second is contributions to international crisis management. But if we have a look at new challenges like hybrid warfare, far below the level of military operations, we have to go a bit further, and this means, this is my personal position, we have to change the perspective from internal, from an internal view uh, on security policy from a German standpoint to a more global approach on challenges uh, ahead of us. We are not able and not willing to take part in global major, in, in global powers competition. Germany is not a global power uh, as the United States or Russia or China and France and the UK are not a global power either. But below this level, I think there is a common interest of Democrats securing individual rights and freedom and uh, the rule of law that uh, we are interested in keeping free trade, free navigation, and uh, freedom of opinion. And this, I think, should lead to this global aspect to contribute below the level of military operations to strengthening democracies around the world. So looking back on the last 30 years of Bundeswehr history, it's clear that our armed forces have developed considerably in a very dynamic security environment and are always capable of adapting to new challenges. This is also true for the current crisis in Eastern Europe, for example, the deterrence and possible defense at the eastern flank of NATO. But we should, below the level of military operations, have a clear concept as Germans, as Europeans. We have to define our role in with respect to our neighborhood around Europe, and we should again define our role with respect to global challenges. And if we take this global perspective in a globalized, digitalized uh, world that becomes where citizens uh, get closer to each other, and uh, I think this is uh, 
one of the lessons we still have to learn, since we see that the United States will withdraw from our European backyards, uh, and this is independent from the current administration in the United States. This is my conviction. So I think we learned already a lot of lessons after 30 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall, but there are still some lessons to be learned in the years to come. Thank you very much for your attention. Unifying a nation takes more than one generation, which is interesting that you brought it up in, uh, coming from your background on the security aspect. Uh, could you develop on that a little bit more? Well, 30 years is, I would say, around one generation. And we can see today that there are still pending tasks of unification in our country. If you look at the results of state elections in Germany, we had the last state elections in, in the end of uh, October in uh, Thuringia, we can see that uh, the results of elections are different in Eastern, U Eastern Germany from Western Germany. And to go a bit deeper, I would say we have to realize that citizens in Eastern Germany have a different socialization, have a different history than citizens in Western Germany. This applies to Eastern Europe too. And I think this is one reason of diverging interests, diverging approaches within the European Union as well. I think it's striking that there seems to be a very similar approach to European integration questions in Poland, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic, but it's different from the Brussels view of European integration, from the westernized approach, because all these European Union member countries, eastwards the former Iron Curtain had a different socialization with the European Union, had a different history. So we cannot simply adapt in Eastern Europe what we already did in Western Europe. And this is our experience in Germany as well. So we started unification by accession of the new lender to Western Germany. But it's not enough to adapt our Western style, Western approach, Western policy to the new lender in Eastern Germany. We have to cooperate at eye level. And I would say many of the current challenges in this different perception of our society in different policy approaches has to do with um, the strategy of both Germany and the European Union to adapt our experiences, our models, our investment strategies to the territories eastwards, the former Iron Curtain. And uh, of course there was a lot of um, exchange of population. Many young people from Eastern Germany uh, moved to Western Germany because they had uh, the better working places, uh, better qualifications, better earnings in Western Germany. And um, at the same time, we had at the beginning some investments from major companies, from major Western companies in Eastern Germany. But until today, 
in the perception of many citizens in Eastern Germany, there were only a few chances for Eastern companies to survive. And uh, the investment strategies of Western companies, yes, they addressed the new lender for some years, but then they addressed bigger markets in Eastern Europe. They went further and further. They had some years of investment in Poland and the Czech Republic, and then went further to the Ukraine and globally. So we see that it takes years and years to unify a country in a way that we can create a common understanding, uh, that we can balance uh, the gaps and the disruptive uh, evolution, in particular in those countries uh, eastwards, the former Iron Curtain. And as I told you, you, you can, we have to ask ourselves as politicians why uh, the election results are so different between Eastern and Western Germany. And my explanation is it has to do with the way we organized uh, German unity. But not to be too negative, it was a huge chance for Eastern Germany that uh, citizens had strong partners from Western Germany. This was not the case in Poland. This was not the case in Hungary, in Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic. Um, people from Eastern Germany uh, declared in this uh, um, unify, unification process, 1989-1990, if uh, the German mark does not come to us, we we will go to the German mark. So they literally voted by foot and went westwards. And uh, in the end, uh, West Germany was a strong partner. There were um, payments for more than 1,000. What, what is the right figure? We had more than 100 billion former marks a year subsidies from the entire society, not only from West, from all the people paying taxes for the new lender. And if you use uh, motorways in Germany, you will find out that uh, the, the modern infrastructure can be found in Eastern Germany, not in Western Germany. So meanwhile, we had some gaps in Western cities, Western infrastructure, whether it's uh, traffic mobility or uh, internet mobility. Um, this is one of the positive aspects of unification. If you have to do a lot, uh, you, you can. You have to do it by fr from the scratch, and that's why there are many positive signs of uh, unification as well. But it takes time. Hello, good morning. I'm professor, uh, assistant professor, Dr. Diego. I coordinate a couple of courses of international relations in Brazil at the Federal University of Goiás. Uh, nice to meet you. Thank you for a great presentation. I would like to uh, pose just one specific challenge. Uh, um, because since I'm from international relations, then I'm more worried about the international politics and so on. And as we all know, uh, Germany is the second largest exporter of goods and services in the world, and the bulk of the German economy depends on exports. Um, however, China, unlike China, unlike the US, uh, uh, the British, and the, the French, Germany doesn't seem so worried about protecting sea routes around the world and protecting their ships around the world, their, their contain uh, containers and so on. And what I'm asking is that, like, so is Germany relying more on bilateral uh, partnerships um, since Germany doesn't have any uh, military bases abroad like uh, British have and the French and the, US, the Americans and so on? Uh, or bilater so bilaterally or um, by, by the partnership 
within the European Union or relying on NATO or even rely on the on the UN mostly so to where where uh, Germany poses its confidence on like where how Germany uh, kind of transfers this responsibility yeah. thank you very much well our primary focus is to strengthen the multilateral rules based order this is not only our German but our European experience what we are experiencing right now, this great power competition among Russia, China, USA, this is quite similar to our experience in the 19th century in Europe, which has been called a concert of nation states. And this concert of big European nations, France, UK, Germany, Russia, ended in two world wars in the last century. So our experience from this lesson, concert of big powers and two world wars in the 20th century was, we have to establish a common table for all participants in Europe, for bigger and smaller countries, for stronger and weaker economies at eye level. This is our core lesson to be learned after the Second World War, and this is the essence of the European integration. To cooperate at eye level among all European countries. And this is, by the way, completely different from what we see in Russia or in China, by all the difference be differences between Russia and China. But both countries don't have a partnership approach to their neighbors. They are focused on dominance, on projection of power. This is not our European way because it's not our experience for more than 100 years. So our lesson to be learned from this is we want to keep a strong international order. We want that at eye level countries set their rules and respect the rules. And that's why we not only can, but we, we do not want to take part in a competition of powers setting their unilateral rules. But secondly, you're right, multilateral institutions are not always uh, capable to act in particular the United Nations. We depend on the willingness of the permanent members of the Security Council. And if there is no solution at this level of uh, the P5, for example in Syria, there is no adequate mechanism to apply. And this is where I would say this is the lesson we still have to learn as Germans and as Europeans. And my personal answer was that we would have to set up an alliance of democracies around the world, interested in keeping a rules-based order, abstaining from unilateral action, and willing to cooperate at eye level. And this would also include or would require from us how to react by not only political means of dialogue and diplomacy, but also by uh, defense instruments. And you mentioned one area of uh, freedom of navigation, uh, free trade. Yes, indeed, Germany has to be interested in free trade and free sea lines. And I can't give you an official answer as government member, but my personal point of view is that indeed this is one of the lessons we still have to learn. But not as a unilateral action, but in close cooperation with France and UK as a nucleus for European Union member countries, we have to define our role towards those global threats, um, 
and we have to define our role when it comes to this well, simple necessity to secure uh, sea routes and uh, freedom of navigation. Um, and this is exactly the concept I tried to line out a bit. Yeah. If we uh, come from a more internal perspective towards foreign security policy to a global approach in this globalized world, then I would say yes, there is a primary responsibility of Europeans, not only of Germany, but including Germany, to secure our European periphery, uh, our neighboring regions, Balkans, Middle East, Northern Africa. And additionally, I see a common responsibility of Europeans to contribute, if necessary, significantly, including uh, defense instruments uh, when it comes to secure free trade and uh, well, rules-based international order worldwide. Excellent. Well, on that occasion, let's please express our sincere gratitude, Mr. Silverwood.